Okay, let's uh, get started. Um, any questions about deliverable nine? You're adding three scaffolds. Yes. So, are we allowed to use like just one, two as text in this one as a scaffold? Uh, like, text as in like English words? Yes. No. No. Are we can use the number one. You can use numbers. Okay. We will assume that our users know numbers, but they do not speak English. So instead of putting a the one like this, we can yep. just have a number one. That's fine. That's okay. fine. Yes. Good clarification. Any other questions? Okay. So let's carry on then. Um, we are going to finish our section on cognitive psychology uh, today, and we're going to finish it with the most subjective aspect of cognition, which is affect or uh, emotion. Could our computers recognize emotions in us? Can we get our computers to advertise that they have emotions, and when and why would we ever want to do such a thing? Okay. Um, hopefully, we will get through 14 today. Uh, again, I apologize. I just put up 15 now. We may get to 15 or not today. We'll see how we're doing. So either today or Monday, we will move into the penultimate uh, theme of the course, which I'm calling Looking Outward. So most of the computer technology we're familiar with is inside, right? Inside the screen, inside cyberspace. But our interactive technologies are increasingly out here in the world with us in the sense that they are sharing what we sense. So when you move, you feel acceleration, and you also visually see that you're, you're moving. Most of our phones are also detecting that movement, right? So our input sensation is becoming, is, or the inputs to our technology is increasingly overlapping ours, and our technology is increasingly able to push against the world literally, literally or figuratively, right? There's a lot of discussion about the internet of things, so physical objects are being connected to the internet, and some of those physical objects are able to move, either to vibrate or move, them, move themselves. So we're going to start with tangible computing, which is tangible or touch, things that we can touch and things that can push back. So we're going to start with some relatively obvious technologies that are out here in the world with us. And then we're going to work our way up through different kinds of technologies that have increasing sensor and actuation capabilities, that they can sense the world directly and they can act in and on the world directly uh, as well as we go. Okay, and we will end with a discussion of robotics. And then the last three lectures are looking inward where we start to combine these things, right? We're overlapping cyberspace with uh, physical space. Okay. Okay. Let's start with, uh, so effective computing, let's start with one of the most famous uh, emotional robots we know. Who is this? Hal. Hal, okay, here we go. Hello, Dave. You're looking well today. Dave, do you remember the year 2000 when computers began to misbehave? I just wanted you to know, it really wasn't our fault. The human programmers never taught us to recognize the year 2000. When the new millennium arrived, we had no choice but to cause a global economic disruption. It was a bug, Dave. I feel much better admitting that now. Only Macintosh was designed to function perfectly saving billions of monetary units. You like your Macintosh better than me, don't you, Dave? Dave, can you hear me, Dave? I apologize, the video didn't work here, but you imagine the camera gradually and very slowly focusing in on the malvolent red eye at the center. So obviously this is a dated video talking about the year 2000. It's an advertisement for, for Max. Why the year 2000? Y2K. Y2K, right? For some of you, you may remember, remember that, right? 
the global economic meltdown didn't actually happen for another eight years, and it wasn't because of Y2K, but, but there you go. Did this cause any malfunctions? I don't think it did. I don't know. A friend of mine. Not as much as people thought. I read out of school then. was a programmer. Okay. That's what he worked on for like a year. The Y2, fixing Y2K Just bugs. Just going in and changing games from two to four days. Before. Okay. Okay. Does Hal have emotions? There's a movie he does. <laughs> Okay, in the, in the movie he does, but here he doesn't? Because this is an actor, right? This isn't really Hal. Does Hal really have emotions in the movie or in the commercial? Well, he says that, you know, he likes him better than that. Uh... I would argue no. I would argue no. When again, we could, we could get into a philosophical discussion about what it actually means to have emotions Let's set, set that aside for the moment and assume that Hal does not, but Hal does a pretty good job of trying to convince you that he does. In this 30-second video, what emotions did Hal express or admit to? Jealousy. Jealousy. You like your Macintosh better than me, don't you, Dave? What else? Sympathy. Sympathy? How so? He was apologizing for his other brethren. Ah, he was apologizing. So sympathy from whom? From Hal or trying to elicit it from, from you, right? So that's something we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about today, right? Even if we know the machines don't actually have emotion, it's easy to trick us into feeling sympathy, feeling sorry, wanting to spend a little bit more time with an interaction because... It's giving the illusion of emotion. What other emotions did Hal advertise during this 30-second spot? Jealousy. Hal said, I feel much better admitting that to you now, Dave, which is relief or contrition, right? Some of you may be willing to forgive Hal after the fact because Hal admitted that he feels better after admitting it. What other emotions did Hal advertise? We had no choice but to cause a global economic meltdown. Not we did, but we had no choice. Subtle difference. Regret, right? I'm, I'm, a, I'm only a machine. We're kind of limited. We had no choice. You didn't program us well. We're not Macintoshes. We couldn't, we couldn't deal with it, right? Okay, so again, we may not want to create machines that advertise emotions in this, well, in this way, but one of the things that was great about the movie 2001 is this evil machine that you can't help paying attention to because of the fact that it seems to be exhibiting these these emotions, right? We just finished a discussion about attention. Things that move tend to attract our attention. Things that emote tend to attract our attention. And even if we know they cannot emote, it's hard not to pay attention to things that are at least giving that illusion. Okay, so just a little uh, tongue-in-cheek intro to effective computing. This was an email I got from HR a few years ago, um, something was wrong with the HR software. The software is currently broken. We're working on it. When it's feeling better, we'll send out the delayed reports. Everybody knows the software doesn't feel better. What is that an example of? Someone saying personification, personification or anthropomorphization, right? Do you ever have that feeling that your computer is waiting until you have an assignment due and then it decides to mess things up, right? It's, it's waiting. It's doing it on purpose. It's vengeful. Okay. Emotion is an important part of HCI, as we've already seen, right? HCI is a mixture of objective and subjective aspects. Emotion is a very subjective thing. So in effective computing, we're going to look at three different kinds of applications. So getting computers to recognize emotions in people, and why would we want to get our software to do so? Enabling technology to, to give the impression of having emotion. Again, we're going to set aside the discussion of whether machines actually can have emotion. For a lot of things, it's enough for them just to advertise or try and cast the illusion 
that they do. And then finally, assuming that we have machines that can detect positive and negative emotions, can they adapt the, the mode of the interaction to increase more positive or elicit more positive emotion from the user in future and minimize negative uh, emotion, right? In order to do that, you're going to have to detect emotion in the user in the, the first place. Okay, so we're going to spend a fair bit of time today talking about emotion. Um, we need, first of all, computers to recognize emotions. 75% of people surveyed admitted to swearing at their computers. I don't remember where I got this statistic from. It's probably wrong, right? It's probably way, way higher <laughs> than that. Would you want your computer to recognize when you're swearing? Maybe not. I would. You would? Why? I want it to do something better when I swear at it. Ah, you want it to do something better, right? So would we consider, first of all, getting the computer to recognize when we're upset with it and give it the leeway to try and adapt and fix things, right? Okay, so we could turn on the microphone and run some speech recognition software and look for the bad words and try and do something that way. Um, your users, when they come into contact with Leap Motion for the first time, they may get frustrated, right? Leap Motion is not perfect. It drops frames, misinterprets the hands, there's occlusion issues. Your, fr your users might get frustrated. You may choose in your final project to either disregard that or build in some additional intelligence to your system to detect when the user is frustrated. And change the visualization or help somehow. How would you detect that your users are frustrated when using your system? Other than the microphone and swearing trick. Okay. Yes, so maybe grab mouse clicks, right? Click, 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 click. That's, that's a pretty good indicator. A lot of simultaneous key presses. So Yes, absolutely, right? But remember that your user is going to be using their primary hand and their secondary hand to do things. So you can set up an interface where they pull their hands out of the field of view of Leap Motion and type something and then go back to this. But for most of you, you'll probably, after the user types in their name and logs in, they're not going to touch the mouse or keyboard anymore. Um, you did moving in and out of the device or the hand constantly moving back and Absolutely, right? So it's not working, reset, right? Turn it off and turn it back, back on again. That might be a sign that they're trying to restart something, but that may not necessarily be an emotional reaction, right? When I tested this out on my friend, he flicked off the emotion. Ah, that's a great one. That, I haven't heard that one before. That one makes sense, right? So you may get your system to recognize an 11th gesture. That's a good one. Okay. Exactly, right? Come on, it's not working, right? That's a pretty common thing. So that's actually a tricky one to pick up on because it's not anything in the gesture itself. You're going to have to detect something over time. What would you be detecting here? So we're going all the way from why we might want to detect uh, emotion to how to detect emotion. What do we need to do in that case? Absolutely, right? Just grab the position of the hand, and if the position is changing by a large amount from one frame to the next, meaning large velocity, and you see enough of that, and maybe you see velocity re reversing, maybe you, you tag that as the user is frustrated, and you add an additional state to your system, which is what to show or what the system should do when the user is frustrated. You'd be surprised how forgiving users are if they realize that your system has recognized that you're upset and will do something differently in reaction to that. One of the things that really piles on the negative emotions is when you're trying to, when you're frustrated and the other person ignores the fact that you're frustrated and carries on with whatever they're trying to convince you of or help you with, right? There's nothing more frustrating than that. And people take those social expectations and apply it to, to software, right? Not only is this system not working, it doesn't know that I'm frustrated and it's just blindly trying to get me to sign the third, the third digit, right? Okay. 
Okay, so again, what, then the question is, what should your system do when it recognizes these various emotions? So in your system, maybe frustration is the main thing you're going to focus on. One of the good things, one of the first things your system should do is stop, right? Whatever it's trying to do, whatever it's trying to teach you, if you're frustrated, system should stop and become a little bit more passive and hand control back over to you, right? Sorry, I didn't understand what you were trying to do. What would you like to do next, right? So what does it mean for the system to become uh, passive? Again, change tactics, do, do something else. Um, if the user seems confused or exhibits wonder, perhaps you give more information. So the user is kind of not sure what's, what's going on or is kind of waiting somehow. You provide more information, less information in the case of frustration. Remember this interaction if the user is pleased. Right? You could add in some functionality where you signal to the user that if they're happy with the way things are going, they do this, the opposite of the 11th gesture. Right? So maybe the system says, what did we just do in the last two or five seconds where the user said, hey, this is great, I'm really enjoying learning the ASL digits. Right? So which emotions are you going to try and recognize and what should your system do when it does so? Okay. Now we get into the tricky part. What are emotions? Uh, again, we're going to try and keep this to a relatively brief discussion. There are basically three components, and like most of what we've done in HCI, we're going to focus on the physiological and behavioral ones and leave the psychological and philosophical ones for, for another time. So one of the obvious things when someone is exhibiting an emotion is there's a physiological response. That response may be conscious or unconscious. When you're frustrated, you're shaking your, your hand. If you're creating a scary video game and the user actually is trembling with fear, maybe that's a good thing given the, the system. Right? So can you actually, in HCI, you're usually focusing on what are the physiological correlates of emotion and how can you pick up on them. Then there is the higher order behavioral correlation, correlate of, of, of um, frustration or anger or emotion. What does the person do? Um, you may have seen people pull back from their screen when they're watching a YouTube video and they're surprised or they're afraid or something you know, grabs their attention. Or they move their head towards the screen. Those are actually very rich signals. And assuming you have a webcam and you can detect head position relative to the screen, that might be a signal that you want to pick up on and change the, the interaction based on, on that situation. What are other examples of behavioral responses to emotion you can think of of people interacting with software? Aside from the swearing. Okay, right. Ab absolutely, right? So that's something you might want to pick up on. That's a good, that's a good signal. If someone ever gets really involved in a first-person shooter and you see them move out of the way because they're afraid to be hit, right? All of those kinds of signals you, could you can pick up relatively easy with a webcam or in our case with lead motion with movement of the, the hand. And again, then what do you, what do, you do with it? Of course, emotion is a very subjective thing, and there's this interesting phenomenon, which we won't deal much more with in this class, which is retroactive cognitive labeling, right? So you pull back from the screen without realizing that you did. It's an instinctual response. And you ask somebody why they did so, and they might tell you they were surprised or they were fearful or... They might change how they describe it based on them now looking back on the experience and thinking about what actually happened. Okay, we're not going to worry too much about that one. We're going to focus on physiological and behavioral correlates of, of emotion. Okay, so uh, you mentioned detecting laughter, right? That's one facial expression we might pick up on. Remember that in HCI, we're also thinking about differences in people. Is laughter always an, uh, a, an exhibit of happiness in all cultures? Not necessarily, right? 
There's an interesting study going all the way back to the 1970s by Ekman and Ellsworth um, to try and actually quantify the physiological correlates of emotion, and in this case, facial expressions, right? Most people, when they're laughing, their mouth is open, their teeth are exposed, and, and other aspects. And Ekman and, and Ellsworth found that different emotions, or people, when they were emoting, actually allowing their emotions to be expressed on their face, tensed particular muscle groupings. And it seemed more or less to be uniform across cultures. So in a lot of cultures, when someone's happy, they smile. It's not always the case, but most of the time, that's, that's true. Um, when someone is angry, um, usually their brow is furrowed, and so on. The fact that this relationship between emotional state and facial expression is relatively uniform across cultures probably means that those facial expressions are much older than culture and probably go back to our evolutionary origins. Why do we frown or bare our teeth or furrow our brow when we're angry? Social interaction, you're trying to communicate the fact that you're angry. Why that particular expression? I mean, this might not be what you're looking for, but I remember reading somewhere that like animals will pick up, like bearing of teeth is like a sign of challenge. Absolutely, right? So we're not the only species that bears its teeth when angry. Why? What are you advertising, aside from the fact that you're angry? Animals are displaying their weapons. They're displaying their weapons, right? It's an advertisement that things are getting pretty bad here, and I'm now considering moving on in, beyond social interaction to physical violence, right? And our expression is some leftover of that evolutionary there are history. There animals, though, that do that to show us emotion. Uh, exactly, right? It's complicated, right? So it's, it, that's just the most obvious example, but we advertise our emotions for lots of different reasons. If we were to take that data set now, the fact that these particular emotions tend to be associated with these, kind, these aspects of facial expression like the baring of our teeth, opening of our mouth, brow, furrowing of our brow or not, um, Pluchik in the 80s took that data and organized it into uh, an emotion wheel where certain, uh, certain emotions are next to other emotions in the wheel. Why? Why is anger next to disgust, and why is anger not next to acceptance or surprise? It's polar opposite. Well, yes. It feels subjectively like these are opposite things. There's another reason. What do some of these neighboring emotions have in common in terms of facial expression? Maybe it's easier just to show you. So I took the upper and bottom parts of faces on purpose because these are not obviously real faces, but hopefully these imaginary faces are pretty successful in communicating, again, quote-unquote, the emotion here. What's in common between anger and disgust? What's different? The brows are, the brows are, are furrowed, right? And the thing that distinguishes in terms of facial expression, to disambiguate between anger and disgust, it's whether the mouth is open uh, or not. So uh, you can take this slide and cover up the bottom parts of these faces or the upper parts, and it becomes difficult to tell whether these half faces are, um, are advertising anger or <coughs> disgust. Right? So we ad if we choose to advertise our emotion, it's because of a combination of facial expressions or parts of facial expressions. What about joy and acceptance? <clears throat> what's common and what's different now? The eyes are both like squinty a little bit. Squinty, right? It's, it's the fact that the muscles in the upper part of the face are relaxed, 
which is an advertise that you're somewhat relaxed, right? This is probably not a negative situation. And then again, we distinguish between the two by what's going on at the bottom part of the, the face. Okay, so obviously you can kind of see where we're going here, right? Some of these facial expressions might be recognizable by a machine learning algorithm coupled to a webcam. How might we go about doing this? Well, of course we need our training set, and in this case the training set is not positions of the fingers in the hand, but it might be images of faces. Depending on what kind of information we want, we might also uh, we, we may also ask the user to wear something. We might want to get uh, electromyogram information, which measures body movement or also muscle contraction. We saw that in the free will experiment with the, the waving finger. Respiration rate, heart rate, skin conductance. These are all obviously important measures of emotion. Our users may not accept that particular solution to detecting emotion. Once we have all that information, then we need to run our machine learning algorithm and do some pattern recognition inside the data set. So can we actually pull out of, uh, of pictures of faces, the amount of furrowing of the brow, curvature of the lips, up and down, and so on. And then once we do, we need to take those higher level features that came from the raw data not unlike Leap Motion, where the raw data is colored pixels, and that's turned into 3D coordinates. Here we're taking colored, pixel, pic, colored pixels from an image of a face and, taking out, and trying to extract features like uh, parts of facial expressions. And then we need to do some more machine learning on top or some reasoning where we transform those features into predictions. Yes? Are there... AI yet that can more or less accurately predict the emotional state? So I know that's a subjective thing to say. But. Yes, pretty good. Assuming that you're emoting honestly, right? I mean, of course, you can fool other humans and you can fool a machine about what your true emo emotional state is. But if you are frowning as if you're angry, that's pretty trivial to recognize. Um, I recently read that there is a technology that uses infrared to blood supply to your face to see whether or not you're lying. There you go. So you could do that too. <laughs> you could do that too, again, whether you would want to or not. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Okay, so in this case, instead of uh, a KNN learner, we just have a whole bunch of if-then-else statements just as a cartoon example, right? So if we detect certain combinations of facial expressions, our software is going to predict the user is happy with what's going on or they're not happy with what's going on. Our system may predict wrong, and again, that's a pretty uh, important situation. If the, if the system thinks that you're happy or relaxed or you're accepting the interaction, you're learning what the ASL system has to teach you, but you're not, you're confused or you're frustrated or you're working hard to catch up, and the system accelerates because it thinks you're doing well and you're keeping up, and you're actually frustrated, that's going to make things much, much worse, right? So again, we might want to put some learning on top where if the system makes an incorrect prediction about emotional state, you take that information, add it to your training set, and improve your learner so it doesn't make that mistake again. So uh, again, here in this cartoon example, it's just restructuring a decision tree, but we could use a KNN learner here. How would you do that? So we want to try and create a system that takes images of faces and tries to predict the emotional state being advertised on each of those faces. How would you apply a KNN here? Are the data points the face or are the data points the actual data that goes to make like picture of their emotion. Right. So let's let's make this a little bit easier. So let's take the raw pixel data and imagine there's already an existing layer of machine learning that can turn those colored pixels into teeth detected equals true or false, lip curvature equals up, is upward or downward. So let's imagine we already have those those features. 
that's exactly what we did. You know, make matrix of conditions and statuses, and then have an input. You know, what is the true emotion? It, exactly right. So in your data set, on every row, when you transfer it into rows and columns, every row corresponds to a single gesture, and associated with each row is a number, which is the prediction of the digit. In this case, the row would just be. How are the teeth detected? What's the curvature of the lips? Is the brow furrowed, yes or no, on that row? And then the output is an integer indicating joy, sadness, frustration, confusion, whatever relevant emotions you want to try and uh, predict. There you go. You put that in your KNN learner. Your webcam snaps a new photo. The first level of machine learning takes those colored pixels and turns it into feature values. You take that row of feature values and put it into your KNN learner, and your KNN learner gives you back an integer saying, I predict that the user is frustrated right now. Did you have a question? I was just wondering, using the KNN, you could also add in like heart rate and skin. I mean, right? Absolutely, right? It doesn't really matter to K the KNN learner what those numbers represent, as long as they're features that correlate with the emotion. So as long as uh, blood flow in the face is a good correlate of mo emotion expressed on the face, then it should help your KNN learner. Okay. Okay, so you can see that we're, on, we're in, the, on, in the process of getting computers to recognize emotion. Let's flip things around now and ask about the second question, which is, aside from making an interesting evil computer in a movie, why would we want to try and get our interactive technologies to advertise the fact that they have emotions? Most of the users are going to know that the app or the robot doesn't actually have emotions. It's just pretending to. But would there be an advantage to, to doing so? As we've already talked about, it's hard for us not to anthropomorphize when we see something that's emoting, right? So when Hal admitted, uh, felt sheepish about this terrible thing that had happened in the year 2000 and felt relieved that he had built up the courage to tell us about it, right? We're, we might be willing to give Hal a second, a second chance, maybe. Okay. So uh, apps or robots or other technologies that emote are trying to get you to enter into this interaction with them and give the system a second chance, right? Software is never perfect. It makes mistakes like we do. You might be able to overlook those mistakes or wait a couple more systems as the system, um, wait a couple more seconds as the system catches up because the system's sorry that it's taking so long. It knows it's a little bit slow. It'll give you the results in a, in a second. Okay. This is particularly important in robotics because we're dealing with a physical object and robots give a lot of more opportunities to uh, illustrate or advertise emotion. These are some snapshots from uh, the Kismet robot which was built at MIT quite a few years ago now. It was built with this uh, exaggerated face and the aspects of the face that were exaggerated are those that are parts of advertising emotion on the face. So it might be hard to see from the back of the room here. This is Kismet trying to exhibit facial expressions that equate with calmness or anger or surprise. So when humans are surprised, our ears don't necessarily go up, but most of us recognize in animals that that's often a, a reaction, uh, disgust, sadness, and interest, and so on. Okay. Uh, I don't know if I can play this in the slide. I was having problems with this before. Okay, let me see if I can find this for you.
so. Okay, so Kismet's saying the same thing over and over again. Do you really think so? And apologies, this is 90s robotics technology. How did Kismet do in advertising different emotional states? Again, given 90s technology here. I think it did well. Okay. Because I could send, I managed to tell the different emotions. I felt like it was a little over exaggerated. Okay. But I felt like it needed to with the technology at the time. Exactly, right? It's meant to exaggerate because there was only so much the machines could do back then. Assuming we do have robots in our everyday lives, would you want them to be doing this? Would you prefer them just to be emotionless machines or to be reacting to whatever you're saying or asking for and inflecting their response with emotional state? Well, it depends on whether or not you're a Spock or a McCoy. If you're uh, Spock, then you're not. <laughs> okay, right, right, exactly. It'd be nice if, you know, like you said, when it screws up in the middle of a sign, it'd be nice to know that your computer feels bad about that. Exactly. Even if you know it doesn't actually feel bad, even knowing that somehow it makes you feel, maybe, makes you feel a little bit better, right? This is this anthropomorphization. It's hard for us to get away from it. It influences our emotional state, right? Something that is trying to meet us on an emotional level has an appeal for, for some of us. Okay, so that was Kismet in the 1990s. That was created by Cynthia Brazil when she was a grad student there. Uh, when she graduated, she went on and founded a company that is making Jibo. Has anybody seen Jibo yet? Okay. This is your house. This is your car. This is your toothbrush. These are your things. But these are the things that matter. And somewhere in between is this guy. Introducing Jibo, the world's first family robot. Say hi, Jibo. Hi, Jibo. <laughs> Jibo helps everyone out throughout their day. He's the world's best cameraman. By intelligently tracking the action around him, he can independently take video and photos so that you can put down your camera and be a part of the scene. Jibo, take the picture. He's a hands-free helper. You can talk to him and he'll talk to you back so you don't have to skip a beat. Excuse me, Anne? Yes, Jibo. Melissa just sent a reminder that she's picking you up in half an hour to go grocery shopping. Thanks, Jibo. He's an entertainer and educator. Through interactive applications, Jibo can teach. Let me in or else I'll... Ha! And I'll... Ha! And I'll blow your house in! <laughs> hey, where'd you go? There you are. <laughs> He's the closest thing to a real-life teleportation device. He can turn and look at whoever you want with a simple tap of your finger. Check out my turkey dinner, Mom. I wish you wouldn't eat that. Hey, they make turkey pizza? I want turkey pizza. <laughs> and he's a platform, so his skills keep expanding. He'll be able to connect to your home. Welcome home, Eric. Hey, buddy. Can you order some takeout for me? Sure thing. Chinese, as usual? You know me so well. And even be a great wingman. You have a voice message from Ashley. Want to hear it? Absolutely. Hey, call me when you're home. Better make that takeoff for two, Jibo. We've dreamt of it for years, and now he's finally here. And he's not just an aluminum shell, nor is he just a three-axis motor system. He's not even just a connected device. He's one of the family. Good night, Jibo. Jibo, this little bot of mine. When I first saw this, I thought this was a trailer for the next dystopian sci-fi movie, right? <laughs> the perfect white family. Exactly. All right, so depending on your point of view, Jibo is either the end of the beginning of intelligent machines, we're getting close to making actual intelligent machines, or it's the beginning of the end of civilization as we, as we know it, right? Take your, take your pick. Jibo is real. Um, it's in pre-order. You can go and, and sign up for a pre-order of Jibo. How many of you are going to go sign up for a Jibo when this class ends? How much does it cost? Yeah, okay. All right. Good, good point. Assuming you could afford it.
Would you want to introduce Jibo into your sure, home? Why sure, why not? Yeah, okay. Want yeah, exactly, right? There's a reason why I showed Jibo and Hal in the same the same lecture. I don't think Jibo's gonna cause the horizon. Okay. I don't like to All right, uh, yes. It's terrifying, right? Why is it terrifying? We just talked about anthropomorphization. Okay, so this is, what's that? It acts on its own. You can see it following you and taking pictures of you, right? Why? Jibo could hide the fact that it's doing it, and I'm sure there will be hacks to make that happen. But at least in version 1.0, clearly Jibo is designed to advertise who or what it's looking at and when exactly it's taking a photo. Why? They freak out because they're not sure if the device is being honest, right? Is it actually taking a picture and not showing the fact that it's taking a picture, which is maybe part of the reason why you feel terrified about about Jibo, right? Jibo is trying to advertise its honesty, right? I'm going to show you when I take a picture. The circle is going to turn into a camera shutter and click. You're going to know what I'm looking at because I'm going to move my head so you can easily infer what I'm looking at and I'm not going to surreptitiously look at something over here without turning my, my head, right? So the flip side of emotional interaction and social exchange is deception. Right? I'm going to advertise one intent while I follow another, another path. And for most people, when they see the Jibo commercial for the first time, that's kind of what comes to mind. I guess, like, to what degree autonomously Well, it's easy to program that, right? The question is... Uh, yeah. I'm sure there's lot, going to be lots of security protocols, and you need to click or unclick a lot of options when you turn Jibo on. I mean, the thing is, with just the way that our data is tracked on the internet, like we already kind of give up pretty much everything about our lives. This is what the Jibo manufacturers are hoping, right? So you guys are already too old, but the next generation maybe doesn't care too much and would be okay with this. Maybe. As you said earlier, we anthropomorphize. It's a I tough one. That word. Yes. But we, we make it, we think it's alive even though it's a robot. I'm already seeing, like, in that commercial, everyone was thanking, thanking him and trying to be as polite as possible to the robot. Right, the TV commercial actors. Yeah. Now, whether it would actually go down like that. I think in real life, if he keeps interrupting me <laughs> when I'm doing something, I'm just going to start saying uh, crude answers to him. I want to know, is he going to keep track of that? How would he respond to that? There's a thin line there, right? Yeah. So the, the wingman Jibo, right, is kind of anticipating what the guy is going to want to do next without the guy having to say all, all of it, right? So that's the good side of emotional interaction. And then there's the bad side of when you get it wrong and I have to actively correct Jibo at, at every step, right? It's kind of a big gamble for this company on which side of that line Jibo is going to tend to fall. Just imagine the robot like accidentally ordering like way too much Chinese food. There's a yes, exactly. I'm sure there's going to be. Uh, never have too much Chinese. There you go. He spends like five hundred dollars. What if Jibo says, "I didn't realize. I'm so sorry. I thought tonight was the party and not next week." Would you feel? Would you forgive Jibo if Jibo knew before you told it that it had made a mistake? Would that make a difference? Gave me the money back. Ah, uh, sure. okay, okay. In that case, per, perhaps. I'm going to feel bad when he eventually breaks and I have to go throw him out. There are some great stories about um, combat robots in the field where um, um, warfighters, when they bring the damaged robot back to the field center and their combat robot is going to be swapped out for another one, they refuse. They say, fix this one. This is my lucky robot. This is my sidekick. Anthropomorphization is especially strong when the two of you are in a dangerous situation, right? The warfighter knows that this combat robot does not have any emotions, doesn't know that the warfighter exists, but... But it's mine. It's, it's mine. Itself. We both survived. He, usually it's he, he, he's still, he's fixable. Fix him. I don't want another machine. I want that one. I think that we already... Have attachments to that. Absolutely. So I think it's really, in my opinion at least, I think it's 
more just because it's such a novel idea. I think it's just going to take a lot of adjustment. It might just take a lot of adjustment, right? The next generation might be surprised that we thought this was creepy, right? Who, who knows? Clearly, Jibo is made to try and exacerbate all those anthropomorphic feelings that you have. And again, you may be okay with that or you may not be okay with that. All right, let's put the social ramifications of Jibo aside for a moment, and let's just focus on the technicalities. How did Jibo emote? So Jibo is the descendant of Kismet here. With like the little eye, the little the, dot. The little dot, right? So Jibo does have a face. It's not a human face. Why did they get rid of the face and stick with just a dot? The Uncanny Valley? Tell us about what the Uncanny oh. Valley is. Like when you look at this face, it reminds me of a Furby. Yeah. There's, there's a disconnect, and like there's a lot of when you try to make something look like a human, but you don't quite reach it, it ends up looking creepy and so reoccurring. Absolutely right. So Kismet and Kirby is, uh, has fallen into the uncanny valley, right? Jibo is clearly advertising, "I'm not a human, right? I'm not trying to be a human. I'm something else. I'm Jibo, right? I'm a new a new category." So there is that aspect, right? So they changed the face of Jibo to avoid the uncanny valley. Why, why the dot, though? They could have done lots of other things. Why just the dot? They got rid of the nose and the mouth. So like you were saying earlier, across cultures, um, people have different facial expressions, different emotions. And okay. I think that's a thing more universal, expressing your emotions through Exactly. They've pared down the complexity of Jibo's face to the bare minimum, right? What is the simplest possible animation that can advertise emotion con emotionally laden facial expressions? And at least, I feel, most of the time it succeeded with just the circle. What was the circle doing to... Well, the circle cheated, I felt like. How so? Like, because if it, you think it's just a circle and you immediately think it's like an eye, and it does motions like an eye, it goes up and down when it's talking, then it can turn into a heart, or turn into a house that gets blown down by the blood. Okay, right. So, did that really break the emotion? So, there's ways that Jibo can emote that are different from how we can. But we understand the intent. Again, this is all emotional inference. Jibo can do something we can't, but it's in the same spirit. It's trying to advertise that it loves the little girl and, and so on. And maybe that's kind of priming us for robots that actually do look more like humans. Like the further you get away from the Uncanny Valley, Perhaps. the easier it is to accept it. Perhaps. Maybe this will allow us to go back and cross the Uncanny Valley. Okay, let's be really technical here. The circle deforms. How is the circle deforming to advertise emotion? Exactly, right? You take a circle and reduce it to a line, and obviously that's winking or blinking. It turned into the, like, the half moon, right? Which is creasing of the eyes when it's laughing, right? There's no mouth, but it's pretty clear, even if you didn't have the audio about the fact that Jibo is laughing. What else did Jibo do when it was laughing? Yeah, the head was, head was bobbing, right? So something that moves, right? So Jibo has a head and a body. But again, like the face, it's been pared down to the bare minimum because body language is also a very important part of establishing a, a, a social interaction, right? The fact that Jibo can move and attend to faces means Jibo not only knows that there are people in the room, but is interested in people, cares about people. Jibo would rather look at faces than look at the wall or look at the floor, right? Jibo is a social being and, as the advertisement says, is part of the, the family. Okay, I think this is a good place to leave it. You have a quiz due tonight and deliverable nine on Wednesday. Have a good weekend. Don't